Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Blessings, here we are at Camp 2023. I wasn't sure if this was gonna happen. I wasn't sure if I was gonna be here. And I'm very thankful that I am. After an absence of, uh, what is it, four years? So it's lovely to be with you. Lovely to see so many familiar faces and people we haven't seen for a while. Children who have grown up, children who have been born. A lot can happen in four years. And I'm so thankful to be here. I'm thankful for the Lord's blessing and mercy. Those of you who might not know me, my name is Nader, and I traveled here from Australia. Arrived at midnight last night. So <clears throat> bear with me if I'm a little fuzzy in my uh, thoughts and in my expressions, but uh, we'll hope to get through our, uh, our study together. Before we get started, just a couple of things. Uh, Don mentioned it, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, just around outside, just around the corner to the right, uh, that's the free book table. I got plenty of books. Please help yourself, take for yourself, for your friends, for your not so close friends even. Uh, I don't wanna take any books back with me, okay? I carried them all the way here. I don't wanna carry them back. So don't be shy, help yourself. And while you're there, I wanna mention, you'll find the, this little card with the, the information on the screen. Uh, same story, grab as many as you like. Uh, that's uh, an online Bible academy. You'll find a number of courses. And it's for a specific kind of uh, person. It's for the person who wants to understand the Bible better, to apply it better, to share it with others. So if that's you, I invite you to join, to sign up, and uh, we can go on a learning journey together. So I just wanted to mention that and invite whoever would like to. And it's all free, as the gospel is. And uh, yeah, as the literature out there on the table is, I know not everything outside is free, that's fine, but the stuff that I have there is free, so knock yourself out, okay? Take as many as you, as you can, and I mean that. Because honestly, look, I tell people this, people always tell me at the book table, oh, look, I, I feel I don't wanna take too many. These books are no good to anyone sitting on my shelf at home. They, know, they do no one any good, so please don't be shy. Okay, I think that's uh, all the announcements and hellos that I had to do as well. Uh, I invite you to join me. Let's have a word of prayer together, and then we'll get into our subject matter. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we are all here this evening, and we have come from near and far. We gather in the name of Jesus, and we claim your promise that your presence will be here that Jesus is in our midst, and I pray that he will be our instructor and our guide by his spirit. I pray that you bless the message, I pray, uh, pray you'll bless the delivery of it, and I pray especially that you will bless the reception of it, that we as a result might be drawn closer to you, and our faith and our focus may be on Christ more firmly and more steadfastly. We thank you so much for all these promises, we thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus we ask. Amen. Amen. I want to begin uh, by asking a question in a couple different ways. Where are you looking or what is your focus? This is the question I want us to keep in mind as we go into our study this evening. Where are you looking and what is your focus? Hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense as we go along, uh, as we see uh, what the Bible and what prophecy especially reveals to us. We're gonna look at prophecy a little bit because prophecy actually gives us an insight behind the scenes. We're living in a world today and we're living in a time where there is a great global deception isn't that right? I don't know if you realize that or not. And if you did, I don't know to what extent you realize that global deception is or, or how deep it is. And we know this because the Bible indicates that to us very clearly. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, we're told, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The Bible tells us here that the devil's purpose and mission is to deceive how much of the world? The whole world. 
global deception that will culminate in the last days. It's not just the devil, it's also his angels who are his assistants in this global deception. Satan is behind it all. Once upon a time, in the not too far past, there was talk of a global deadly disease and pandemic. And uh, there was also talk of a very effective inoculation that would uh, save people and prevent transmission. Well, that turned out to be very different to what was promised and what was told. It didn't stop transmission, wasn't even properly tested, and uh, it was a classic over-promise and under-deliver. Supposed to be the other way around. In the process, some people made a lot of money. In the process, lots of controls and intrusions and loss of privacy were implemented and occurred. Freedoms were lost. Now, what I'm sharing with you is not some uh, fairy tale. It's something that uh, you would have experienced. We all did not long ago. And what I'm sharing is public knowledge to a large degree now. But amazingly enough, what I just shared with you, despite the fact that it's come out in the open and it's fairly public, yet so many people still believe the fairy tale. So many people still believe the narrative. The devil's work is to deceive. Deception is the name of the game. That's not the only place where we're told that. Here's how Paul says it to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13. He says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul was warning Timothy about things that will happen in the church and things that will culminate and also happen in the world. I want us to notice the two things that are linked together here. The persecution of believers is linked with evil men getting more and more evil. Isn't that right? That's exactly what the prophecy in the book of Revelation tells us. Evil men and seducers will get worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Think about that. They are deceiving and they themselves are deceived because the master deceiver has deceived them. And they have turned to be his agents who are now deceivers and they're described here by the apostle as evil men. It's not just evil men, it refers to them as seducers. What's a seducer? If you look up the meaning, it actually is uh, linked, the meaning is linked with a wizard. A seducer is someone who deceives, someone who enchants. It's like putting a spell on you. That's the idea, an imposter, someone who seduces. So evil men will be used by Satan some of whom are deceived. In other words, they themselves are deceived. They really believe the lies of Satan and they turn to be deceivers themselves and seducers. And the apostle says this is going to get worse and worse and worse as we come to the end. We're living in that right now. I find that quite amazing. From this verse, I can deduce, and I think you would agree with me, that uh, everything we went through recently which seems to be over for now, there is more to come. And it will get worse if Bible prophecy is true. And it is. So things are far from over. I want to look briefly at some of the evil seducers, these evil men, these evil seducers, and look at what some of the plans are, who's really behind it. It's Satan. I want us to keep that in mind. I want us to keep in mind the fact that these deceivers are themselves deceived. That is why they are so convincing. That is why it seems like it is so sincere, because they themselves are deceived. The way that Satan accomplishes this global deception, Satan and his angels, is by targeting a certain group of people. Because remember, he's trying to deceive the whole world. How does that happen? Revelation 16, 14 tells us, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world 
to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Think about that. The spirits of devils. This is describing to us how Satan and his angels will deceive the world. Who do they target? They go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. The leaders of the world. Those in positions of influence. The elite, the rich, the famous, the powerful, the influencers. That's a common term today. These are the ones that Satan and his angels target. And through them, he can accomplish the deception of the whole world. Can you see that? And this is what the apostles refer to, referring to when he says that these are evil men who are seducers, deceiving and being deceived. That's his target. Now, oh, this, we're going too fast, too far. Let's, let's slow down. Today in the world, Sadly, we live in a world that revolves around people looking up to those in positions of influence, authority, and power, and leadership. And people will generally believe what they're told by those in, those in positions of authority. This is why Satan uses that method. Now, interestingly enough, and no surprise, Satan uses the same method to accomplish deception in the church. You realize that? by targeting the leaders, those in leadership positions. There are plans underway for worse deception and control by these evil men, as we just read in the book of Revelation. One particular entity that has come into focus of late is the World Economic Forum. You heard of the World Economic Forum? I think everyone over the past few years has because they seem to have played a very interesting role. This is their mission. The forum engages the foremost political, business, cultural, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. Can you see any similarity here with prophecy? Who's their target? Foremost political, business, cultural, and other leaders of society. That's the same target of Satan and his angels, the kings of the world and the nations. And what's their purpose? To shape global, regional, and industry agendas. Now, it sounds good, good on the face of it, but it's quite, quite different when you really look at what it's about. And as it says there, the idea is to improve the state of the world by changing it to something better what is commonly referred to as the Great Reset, reshaping the world. Now, the World Economic Forum, founded by this man, Klaus Schwab, uh, has a number of members. And it's interesting that the members in this World Economic Forum are hundreds and hundreds of corporations and businesses that are leaders in all kinds of industries. Amazingly enough, the list is quite impressive. I'm not going to read the whole list, but Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Apple. Top tech global industries are all members in the World Economic Forum, partners, as they are referred to. Why is that significant? Because the influence, the combined influence and impact of all these companies is quite staggering. I dare say most, if not all of us here, are influenced by one or more of those tech companies. Isn't that right? Essentially, the whole world is, almost. And it serves to indeed shape and change society. These are just four. There are hundreds and hundreds. The list is actually quite staggering and impressive. Not only is uh, the membership interesting, but it also generates a lot of the funding for the uh, World Economic Forum. Here is this article. Only the world's top political and business figures can attend Davos. That's the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. But uh, I find it very interesting. This is what it says uh, just underneath. The World Economic Forum, which is held at a Swiss ski resort, is an invitation-only conference. You also have to be a member, which can cost between $62,000 and $620,000 a year. 
So not only is this some kind of a membership, but this membership costs these companies money. This is the annual fee to be a member of the World Economic Forum. Hundreds and hundreds of leaders of all kinds of industries and tech companies are members. This is the amount of money that it costs. That is incredible. And the purpose is to reshape the world. And prophecy tells us Satan and his angels have a mission to deceive the whole world. There are many high-profile names that go to these meetings. If I was to read you a list, it would be a very impressive list of names that you would recognize many of them. And you will find that they are leaders in all world leaders, business leaders, uh, in all kinds of industries. I'm not going to uh, do all of that now because that's not my purpose today. I just want to show the alignment between prophecy and between what is happening in the world. Asking the question, where are you looking and what is your focus? Keep that in mind. Okay, we're we're going to get to a point, and uh, the point is a very practical one. The plans and the agenda of this World Economic Forum were outlined in this publication, COVID-19, The Great Reset. The interesting thing about this book is, as it says there, the book looks ahead to what the post-coronavirus world could look like barely four months after the outbreak was first declared a pandemic. Did you realize that this book was actually published in uh, July of 2020? Do you remember when the pandemic became a pandemic? Around March 2020. March, April, May, June, July. That's a, that's a very quick write-up of a book and print it and publish it. You would almost think some of these people knew what was happening. Maybe they had something to do with it. Maybe it was part of the plan. Well, that's what some people suggest. The Bible tells us there is a plan to deceive the world. Satan is actually behind that plan. It goes on. Here is something else from that book. Every country from the United States to China must participate. And every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. (coughs) That's what's happening right now. That's why the membership list is impressive. That's why the invitation only guests that go to that meeting is very impressive. There is a plan that is happening. Can you see what's going on? And if you can, the real question is, what are you doing about it? The amazing thing is there's such a level of of hypocrisy and uh, double standard that it's quite, uh, it would be be, uh, humorous if it wasn't so tragic because it's part of the deception. For example, here's this article. A thousand private jets swoop in to execute great resets. Talks about the wealthy elite traveling through the World, World Economic Forum in their private jets. You know what's interesting? Private jet emissions quadrupled during Davos 2022. This article is more than eight months old. This is the the article, the source of it. Climate campaigners accuse leaders of hypocrisy as flights emit as much CO2 in in a week as 350,000 cars. Isn't that interesting? Because part of the agenda and the Great Reset is concern for the environment and the planet. And what are we going to do about it? And it's everyone's shared problem. And the people who discuss and plan all of this, they use their private jets to go and talk about that. Hypocrisy and double standard. Part of the hypocrisy and part of the problem, uh, sorry, and part of the program is to alter almost everything we're familiar with, even down to the food that people eat. So the elite get to travel in private jets, and for those who are not elite, Bugs are planned to be on the menu. You realize that? Global plans. Companies are involved. Agendas being pushed. Things are happening behind the scenes. And sometimes it's not so much behind the scenes. But the Bible prophecy foretold that this is what would take place. Satan is the ultimate one behind this. And deception is on a global level. 
They have a young uh, Global Leaders program. Again, the list of names on that program is very, very impressive. You'll be surprised how many names you recognize of leaders of countries and nations in the world. And uh, part of the program as well is a plan for total control. The book of Revelation tells us that part of the deception is that there will be control over who can buy and sell, right? Only a certain group of people will be able to buy and sell, those who have the mark of the beast. If you don't, you will not be able to buy or sell. You'll be locked out of the system. How can that be accomplished? Well, if the system is so set up that it's very easy to lock people in and out. And what we're talking about, quite simply, is a very digitized or digital system. What is being set up is a digital prison. And I have news for you. Most of us are already in it. But it's getting tighter, it's closing, it's closing in. That's why a lot of these companies are the leaders in tech companies. This digital prison, why am I saying that? Because when things are digital, when everything is digitized, it's much easier to control. For example, the G20 countries have committed to a WHO, that's the World Health Organization, a WHO-backed global health passport. Did you realize that? Now this happened in 2022, late last year. We're told now that the emergency and the pandemic is over. But the G20, the, the 20 countries, the leading countries which represent the majority of economic and population in the world, economy and population in the world, they've already agreed and committed to a global health passport. That's why I'm saying something else is coming around. That's why we're asking the question, where are you looking, what's your focus? What are you actually doing about it? Here's another one. Biden, world leaders signed declaration to adopt vaccine passports for international travel. Now we saw recently that international travel was restricted and certain requirements were in place. Some places were totally closed. Well now we're traveling again and it seems everything's back to normal. It seems that way. I really wonder how long that will last. That's why I'm very thankful that I could actually be here. Who knows what will happen next year? As a matter of fact, before I came here, hearing some things and rumblings on the news, I was wondering what's going to happen while I am here. Yeah. I was telling my wife, look, I'm going to the US. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I might end up having to stay longer than I planned. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, anyway, I'm not going to go through all the news and the things that happened. We all went through it. My purpose today is not really to focus too much on that, but I want us to take a look at it and understand where we are in light of prophecy. But I don't just want us to look there, because sadly, this is the problem too many times. Too many people are just looking at all the plans of the enemy and are very preoccupied with what the enemy is doing and what the enemy is up to. And this is certainly not what I'm going, uh, what I'm planning to do this evening. But there's some more examination that we need to do before we get to the crux of the matter. This digital prison that we're talking about, right? Travel, but here's another agreement. G20 announces plan to impose digital currencies and IDs worldwide. So you're gonna have a vaccine passport. All these countries already agreed. It's interesting, they agreed to, uh, to uh, or they committed to do something when the need for it has supposedly gone. Interesting. But now there is also digital currencies and there is IDs worldwide. There is a digital prison that is being constructed around us. Most of us are pretty much in it. 
the way the system is set up, the way the world functions, the way the world operates, the way we have phones, bank accounts, whatever it is, passports, IDs, all kinds of things. We're already immersed in it. Now, I'm not saying this to make you feel bad or try and tell you, listen, you need to ditch all of that stuff. All I'm saying is Satan is very successful at his global deception, a little bit at a time, one step at a time. Because think about it. Satan is going to deceive the whole world. What about the church? What about God's people? I put it to you that many of God's people are as deceived as the world. Professed God's people. That's what I'm talking about. The digital currencies is quite interesting. Digital currencies are what's becoming commonly referred to and known as the central bank digital currency, CBDCs, bank-issued digital currency, programmable money, where everything you do with it not only can be tracked, but can be controlled. You know, then it's very easy and simple to understand when the Bible talks about disabling a group of people from buying and selling. That's possible when there is a digital system in place and when there is digital currency that's happening all around us. Now, I want to look at a connection here because you think, well, what's, what's the relevance of this to us? I'm not just wanting to focus on the organization of the World Economic Forum. We need to bring it uh, to, into harmony with what the Bible reveals. Because when you understand, the real issue that is happening is a spiritual one. The real issue that's taking place is not an environmental one, it's not an economical one, it's not a health one, it's not a political one, it's actually a spiritual one. That is really the issue that Satan has in mind and is pushing. But that's not perhaps fully revealed even to those that he uses because they are also deceived themselves and because they are deceived, they are very good deceivers. Here are some interesting connections that you might or might not have been aware of. Socialist Archbishop inspired architect of the Great Reset. This man, Klaus Schwab, German gentleman, who was raised Roman Catholic, interestingly enough, says, here it is, the Great Reset leader, Klaus Schwab, has said that a meeting with Brazilian Archbishop Helder Camara was a crucial moment in his life. Interesting connection. Let's see how far this connection goes. Davos, church already dedicated to themes of forum. What church is that? Well, this is the Vatican News. The Catholic Church is already committed to the various issues considered at the World Economic Forum in Davos, both globally and locally. Interesting. Bible prophecy reveals to us that this is a power that will be used to accomplish global deception. So here you have now a connection between the leaders of the world in business, industry, global leaders, influencers, who pay a lot of money to be part of this very special, elite, unique club to sit and plan the reshaping of the world, to turn it into a digital prison. And the Roman Catholic Church supports and endorses that. Why isn't that interesting? That's Bible prophecy. Now, it gets deeper and gets closer to home when we realize Here's what Pope Francis says. Pope Francis says, Laudato Si 2.0 will be released October 4, Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. Now, what does that mean? Let me, let, me, let me decipher that for you just a little bit so you can appreciate the significance of that. In 2015, the Pope wrote an encyclical entitled Laudato Si about concern for the environment and the issues about you know, pollution and the world and all of that stuff. So what he's planning to do, as it says here, is he's planning to write a follow-up, a continuation, part two of that encyclical, and it's going to be released very soon. October 4th, that's around the corner. I wonder what will be in part two. 
Well, we, we don't have to wait long to find out. But you can have an idea when you look at part one and realize what's at the foundation of the concern for the environment and all these issues that are the, you know, the, the, the world is, uh, the globe is, is burning up. It's, it's all uh, falling to pieces because of all these emissions and all these things that we need to change and we have to be concerned for the environment. What's at the heart and the core of it? It's very interesting when you examine it. Here it is from the Vatican website. Laudato Si, the encyclical letter of Pope Francis on care for our common home. Now, uh, I was curious, and maybe you, were, you might be too, talking about the environment and care for our home, does the Pope have anything to say about the gods that they worship and the connection there? And the answer is yes. Here is a simple search in that encyclical for the word Trinity. And lo and behold, it's right there. The Trinity and the relationship between creatures. Now, I'm not going to read each and every one, but uh, here's another section in the encyclical. The queen of all creation. Who's that? Mary. The Trinity. In talking about the environment. Well, here it is. Laudato Si, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis encyclical for all people. He says, consequently, when we contemplate with wonder the universe in all its grandeur and beauty, we must praise the whole Trinity. Global solidarity, which flows from the mystery of the Trinity. So the underlying cause and factor for concern for the environment and the uh, contemplating the wonder of the universe, it all has to do with the God that is worshipped. We must praise the Trinity and our unity and our global concern for the home that we live in, which sounds so beautiful and wonderful. It says it, it, says it all flows from the mystery of the Trinity. You can't make this stuff up. It's interesting, you follow all these connections, and then people wonder why we talk about the Trinity and why we try and expose that the Trinity is a grave deception and a distortion of the God of the Bible, and the Trinity is actually used by Satan as an underlying factor and unifying factor to bring the whole world together in solidarity, and the issues that are being promoted are issues of concern for the environment, care for the world, and, and people get caught up in these uh, you know, issues and think, yeah, that's a great idea, and, and become activists in it, not realizing what's really under the surface. I find that amazing, absolutely amazing. And so here it is again. The Pope says he's writing a part two to encyclical on the environment. So part two is coming. Let me tell you something. Part two is going to build on the exact same foundation that we just read in part one. It's going to be more of the same. But of course, that's not made prominent. Uh, you see it there if you look for it, but it's not made prominent. A lot of people don't realize or understand what is really going on. The real issue, the real agenda is a spiritual one. It's one of worship. Of course, you're familiar with what the Catholic Church says about the God they worship. Here's the catechism. Now, this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in unity. The faith of all Christians rests on the Trinity. You're familiar with these statements, right? You're familiar with these quotes. Hopefully now you understand a little bit more in perspective what is really going on. Don't get confused or distracted by some of the forefront issues that are being promoted, you have to understand what is really going on. Where is your focus? Where are you looking? And then we want to look at what you are doing about it. The Bible tells us it's a spiritual issue. Here's Revelation 13, 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Here is the end result of this global deception. What is it? Worship. Worship to the dragon, worship to the beast. Particularly, 
The dragon is the power behind the beast. Who is the dragon? We just read that at the beginning. It is Satan. So the real agenda of the Great Reset, the real agenda of reshaping the world is a spiritual agenda. Hidden and masked under a number of issues that are being promoted that at the front of them they sound good. Protect people's health. Vaccine passports. What a great idea. Track people's movements. Digital ID. Fantastic. Protect people's funds. Digital currencies. Bring it on. And so many people in the world, they hear these things and they say, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Many people in the church don't realize what is really going on. Bible prophecy. It's a spiritual issue. Like we said before, you have to understand and discern. It's not really about health. It's not really about care for the environment. You know, if people really cared about the environment, they wouldn't fly around in their jets, right? It's not about the economy. It's about the spiritual issue that matters. It's about bringing in a level of control to accomplish the enforcement of the spiritual issue, which is all about worship to the dragon. And the God of Rome is very clearly declared by them to be none other than the mystery of the Trinity. In light of this, I really find it amazing. And people still ask me sometimes, why do you talk about the Trinity so much? Because we're right in it. That's the issue that is deceiving, the, not just the world, that is deceiving the churches today. You will be controlled. That's Satan's plan. Now, I want to give you an idea from the Bible about the extent of this, because it's quite alarming. It's so alarming, a lot of people find it hard to believe. I realize that in my discussions and talking with people, some, many people find it hard to believe the, the level and the extent of deception and how much Satan has to do with the world. I want to read you this verse from Ephesians 6 and verse 12. The apostle says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is our battle. So I want you to think about that. We don't wrestle with our brothers and sisters who don't agree with us doctrinally. That's not the enemy. That's not who our fight is with. And yet, sadly today, among God's people, among us, there is so much wrestling and vying and competition between different people and different ministries and different groups and on and on and on. That's why I'm saying Satan is very successful at not just deceiving the world, but even deceiving many in the church. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not the enemy. This brother and sister who don't agree with you or me or who don't agree with each other, that's not the enemy. Satan, I think, has deceived us to a great degree on this point. There is such wrestling that sometimes people will not attend certain gatherings based on who's going to be there or who's not going to be there. Speakers say, I will not share the pulpit with this or this or this person or that person because they are considered as an enemy. And what's the reason? Because they don't agree with certain interpretations of certain Bible passages. We've left the real enemy and we've turned on each other. And meanwhile, the real enemy is getting his, his agenda through the whole world. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, I'm not saying this to, to try and imply that we should just, you know, agree to, uh, on, on any doctrine and any teaching and nothing matters. No, it, truth matters. But you must know who the real enemy is. And you have to be focused. And you have to know where you're looking. But the rest of the verse is very interesting. When Paul now tells us who the real enemy is, who we wrestle against is principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. In short, what that's talking about is Satan and his hosts. That's the real enemy. Satan and his angels, as the book of Revelation brings out. And then he says something at the end of the verse that's very interesting. He refers to them as the rulers of the darkness of this world. Do you remember the book of Revelation says that Satan and his angels, they go out to the kings of the world. The rulers of darkness of this world. It's interesting, on a global level. Then he says, against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. What are these high places that he's talking about? The high places here are heavenly places. Heavenly places doesn't mean heaven where God resides. Heavenly means uh, above our heads, high places. What does that mean? The high places of the world. The, the elite strata of the world. The heavenly places. The, the level that is above our heads. According to the apostle here, he says, such high places of power, influence, and authority are actually wicked. The high places of power, influence, and authority in the world, referred to here as heavenly places, there is wickedness there. I want us to note something here. He doesn't just say there is wickedness there. He refers to it as spiritual wickedness. I want you to pause and think about this. The Bible tells us that Satan is the god of this world. We saw from the book of Revelation who he targets, where he wishes to work. And here we're told in those influential places of the world, there is spiritual wickedness. You know what that means? It's not just human wickedness. It's not just human ingenuity. This is spiritual satanic wickedness. You know, you share that with people, people find it hard to believe. You say, oh, come on, you're talking about, you know, leaders or governments or tech companies or all these people, the elite, that in these heavenly places, in these high places that are above our heads. You say, no, you're, you, can't, you can't say that Satan has these things to do with them or they have something to do with Satan. The Apostle Paul says there is spiritual wickedness. The agenda and the issue of deception in the last days is a spiritual one that has to do with worship. And he says, in those places, the influential places of the world that will be used by Satan, there is already spiritual wickedness that exists there. Now, my purpose today is not to delve into the spiritual wickedness that exists there. I just want to alert you to the fact that the Bible tells us what kind of wickedness exists there. Spiritual wickedness. Now, in light of this, what are you doing about it? What am I doing about it? Knowing this, how does that impact our decisions here and now today? That's the question that really matters. Where are you looking? Where is your focus? How do you respond to that? Because it is really high time that we wake up. When I talk about spiritual wickedness in high places and that Satan has much to do with the leaders in this world, and the selection of leaders in this world, some people find that hard to believe. Let me share with you a verse you're familiar with from the temptation of Jesus in Luke 4, verses 5 to 7. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Remember that temptation Jesus uh, faced? Remember his answer? Get thee behind me, Satan, right? Satan did, uh, uh, yeah, Satan did not succeed in tempting Christ with this offer. But did you know that uh, Satan does not, did not make this offer only to Christ? You know that offer is made to so many people? Let me put it to you this way in light of this verse. Worshiping Satan is the key to power and glory in this world. That's what it says, right? You want power? You want glory in this world? You got to pay homage to who? The God of this world. And you know that there are so many people who will say, yes, sign me up for that. Now, let that sink into your mind for a minute then maybe that will help you understand and appreciate why the apostle says there is spiritual wickedness in high places. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that is so demonically and satanically wicked, we really have no idea. We are led to believe that we live in a world where there is freedom and democracy and rights and privacy and all these wonderful things that we are sold when the reality is very different. And certain events that take place that really reveal the level of control that exists 
that there is indeed spiritual wickedness. The sad danger is that many times we get caught up in the politics of it all. We get influenced by the narratives that are often repeated through the media. Whether we like it or not, we live in it and it influences us. And it influences to such, us in, to such an extent that many times it actually impacts our faith and our decisions. And this is where the issue really matters. In light of what we're reading here, I want you to think about if Satan really means what he says, and Satan really is the one who gives power and authority in this world. And on the flip side, we are led to believe that we live in a democracy where we can choose which leaders are the leaders of nations. Some people actually believe that we, by voting, can choose who has power and authority in this world. Now, it's okay if you believe that, but with a Bible in your hand, a Bible that reveals to you what is really going on in the world and how this world operates, how can you really believe that? We are so influenced by the propaganda machine that we get caught up in these things. And you know what happens? People, believers, get very excited, very hopeful, and very agitated around election times because they think certain candidates might be better than others because they can accomplish certain changes. You know what I'm talking about? That's, that's a fact. Bible prophecy gives us an insight to what is really going on. By osmosis, we are adopting elements of Satan's global deception. It's time to wake up. Now, someone might say, and this is an objection I want to address here quickly. What are you talking about, brother? Satan setting up leaders and uh, Satan giving power and authority to people. Uh, the book of Daniel tells us in the story of Nebuchadnezzar that God rules in heaven. He sets up kings and he removes kings. Remember that verse? So what are you talking about with Satan is the one who gives power and authority? It's God who does that. I want to tell you something. God's kingdom rules over all. There's no question about that. God can set up kings and remove kings. But the Bible also tells us that while the heaven and the heaven of the heavens is the Lord's, the earth he has given to the children of men. You know what that means? God has allowed this world to operate in the way that it has chosen. And the world has chosen Satan to be the God of this world. And God has permitted and God has allowed that to take place. It's interesting that in the same book of Daniel, the Bible tells us that God places the basest of men as the leaders of nations. You know what that means? Many people think God makes a decision. Okay, I'm going to choose this person to be the leader of this nation. Or that person or the other person. God permits, God allows certain things to take place, to play out. And what ends up happening is the basest of men, the most devious, the most selfish, the ones who can outwit everyone else, end up in positions of power and authority because they give homage to the God of this world. And God permits this to happen. God is not in heaven interfering with every single decision and every single thing that's happening in this world. God is permitting many things to take place to reveal the real issues at play in the great controversy. Amen. And Satan knows this. And it's for this reason that the devil says, I can give power, I can give authority. I am the God of this world. That's why we're saying what we're saying. So what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do in light of that? Brothers and sisters, it's time to wake up. And it's time to wake up in a way that we haven't really woken up yet. You know, the sad thing is this. We think that knowing this, some of this information and details, we think that means we're awake. We, we run to the devil. Yeah, we know what's happening. Yeah, we, 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 we got some insight into his plans. And we think that's being awake. It's not. And that's not why I'm sharing some of this information here tonight. I'm sharing that so I can ask the questions that really matter. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. 
a beautiful verse, what does it mean? It's not just about chariots and horses. There is a modern, current application for the meaning of this verse. The psalmist here says, there are some people in time of trouble and turmoil, they trust in physical items and things for their safety and security. Back in those days, some chariots and horses ensured that you had a better chance of defeating the enemy. You get yourself some latest iron chariots, some uh, well-bred uh, horses, and you have a good chance of winning the battle. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we have stories of the Israelites being concerned that they would lose because the enemy had superior chariots. The modern equivalent today, I want you to think about that. So many people trust in physical preparation as the means of navigating the trouble that is coming. Okay, we see the deception. We see it's coming. We see more is coming. So what are, doing, what are we doing about it? We are trusting many times in chariots and horses, in things, stocking up, finding a hiding spot in the bush behind my property. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on anyone. I'm not trying to, uh, I, I want to I give this its fair hearing and a balanced view. Because I've had conversations with people who, who read this, they have a plan. And it's good to have a plan. But here's the thing. Is that where your ultimate trust is in? In all the physical preparation that you can accomplish. Some people feel, oh, you know, if I just had a, a country property and it's in such a situation, it's remote, I'm all set. And they try and accomplish that. And it's good to have a plan. But let me tell you something. The spiritual issue, the spiritual deception requires spiritual preparation more than physical preparation. There are two extremes. One extreme is going and focusing all, all the physical things. I'll go find a place in the country, I'll stock up, I'll find some, some people even want to stock up on ammo and guns and all kinds of stuff, and I'll have a garden and it's hidden and all of this, and, and their focus is all on the physical preparation to the neglect of the spiritual preparation that really matters. On the flip side of the coin, there are people who want to justify not doing anything to prepare, and say, I just trust in the Lord, and they do nothing. Two extremes. It's important to trust in the Lord and to do everything we can and rely ultimately on the Lord. That's what the psalmist is saying here. Some trust in chariots and horses, but we, as believers, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And when he talks here about remembering the name of the Lord, it, does, it doesn't mean in our minds we'll remember the name of the Lord. It means we will trust in the identity of the true God that we know and worship. We will trust in Him. That's what it means to remember the name of the Lord. Amen. That's the name of the true God. It's not about knowing a name or repeating a name in a certain language. It's about trusting in God fully. Spiritual preparation. It's not possible to reform the system from within. Many times we trust in that the tragedy that is coming might be averted by some change from within the system. And like I said, sometimes people's believers' hopes and anticipation rises when there is some kind of change in government, when there is election, when there is possibility that someone else might come in, because we, we hope maybe somehow change will come about. Let me tell you something. It's not possible to reform the system from within. According to the Bible, it is corrupt to the core. There is spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not possible to trust in some deliverer to rise up, some favorite candidate, whoever it might be. As the saying goes, and it's inspired by this verse, put not your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in geriatric senators. <laughs> Don't put your trust in senile presidents. Don't put your trust in, in bombastic, hopeful ones either. Don't put your trust in young, tech-savvy ones who promise great change. Look, these things influence believers. And we start thinking, well, maybe this, maybe that, maybe the other thing. It's a spiritual battle. You need spiritual preparation. Where? 
are you putting your trust? All these people will not save the day. They will let you down. Whichever way the election might go, or the selection. And that's why it's tragic. Look, it's election time coming up, right? People are getting excited. People are really getting excited about it. Well, it's going to be over soon. And let me tell you something. Whatever the outcome, it's not going to change what prophecy says will happen. Whoever it might be, there still will exist spiritual wickedness in high places because Satan is still the god of this world and his agenda is a global deception. There are two extremes I want to warn against here as well in what we're looking at. The one extreme is where people believe everything they're told by the official media and they believe the official narrative. And they find it very far-fetched to think any different, and they say, careful of these conspiracies. If you say anything different, it's a conspiracy. Now, that's fair enough and understandable for people who don't have a Bible or believe what the Bible says. But there are believers who fall into this trap. I've had conversations with people who don't want to hear anything other than the official narrative. They find it too far-fetched that deception can exist on such a level. That's alarming. Beware of falling into that trap. The equal and opposite extreme, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, is to believe everything other than the official story. So people end up believing every strange, bizarre, and laughable conspiracy theory that is out there. And let me tell you, there are plenty out there. So I'm not standing here to try and advocate one or the other. I'm trying to advocate the Bible picture of what we need to do, where we need to focus, where we need to look. And my question to you is, where are you looking? Some people are looking at all these things that are coming, and they're really concerned and fearful because they feel they are not ready, because they don't necessarily live in the country, they don't necessarily have a little garden, they don't necessarily have you know, a hideout somewhere, and they are concerned. What should concern you more is your spiritual preparation. I have news for you. Not everybody's going to make it to the country, okay? Not everybody's going to have a country property. Many people will want that with everything they desire, and it's just not possible. It's just not going to happen. And sometimes people paint that as the only solution to the point where people are led to feel guilty and fearful and like they're not going to make it because they still live in the city somewhere. Don't put your focus and your trust in just physical preparation. Now, in saying this, I don't want to justify and excuse people say, oh, look, the brother said here, don't worry about country property. Phew. I don't have to worry about that. I'm not saying don't do that. Do everything in your power to have a plan physically, but don't make that your ultimate trust because it's not just a physical issue. Sometimes, another danger is people get so caught up in trying to find out every detail of the enemy's plans. Find out what the devil is up to. What are they doing? And there is this video, and that video, and that conspiracy. And there is no end to the videos and the conspiracies that exist. You can spend a lot of time and energy watching all manner of videos, learning all manner of details of, about the enemy's plan. And it will not help you one bit to navigate what's coming. I know there are people who are so into that. And I, you know, I, I receive communication from these people. And the communication is in the form of a link to another video, and a link to another video. And, link, and I don't watch all these. I don't have time to watch all these videos. You, know, you can get an idea from the title what it's about. But there is a general, general preoccupation of what's the devil up to? Oh, look at what these elites are doing here and now. It's good to be aware of it. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's good to get, OK, you know, touch base and realize, okay, prophecy is fulfilling. We get a general idea of what's happening. But we can get so immersed in the details that that's all we are beholding, and it impacts our spiritual prepare, uh, preparedness. You realize that? So where are you looking? The equal danger is also to look the other side and turn the, a blind eye to everything. Beware of extremes. Now, having said this, I know people will think, oh, well, I better be careful what I send, uh, what I send Neder. 
he's going to talk about it in a sermon one time. So it's fine. I'm not, I'm not knocking what people are sending. I understand it's, it's with good motive. I understand it's with a purpose to see what's happening, understand what's going on. If it's with the purpose to alert and awaken you, to focus on spiritual preparation, that is good. But let me tell you something. Your faith does not grow by beholding the plans of the enemy. Your faith grows by looking at God's word, believing God's word, experiencing the miracle of God's word, what it promises that Christ can come and abide in you and your relationship with Christ. If looking at prophecy and fulfilling prophecy leads you back to the Bible, then that's good. Mission accomplished. If you get so distracted that you keep focusing on all these details, you're in danger. So where are you? Where are you looking? You actually need to beware of your favorite conspiracy source. Right? Some people have favorite conspiracy sources, right? This is the, watch this one or that one, this agency, this person, and their latest video, and yep, yep, all, you've got all that. And, and they, they start trusting in all this information. Beware. Where is your faith and trust, really? Here is our mission. Here is our focus according to Christ. From the chapter that deals with the end of the world, where Jesus warned against deception time and again, where Jesus warned about false Christ and false prophets who will deceive many, here is what he says, and this is our mission. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This is the part of Matthew 24 that really matters. We get caught up in the details of this deception and this false Christ and false Messiah and, and false prophet and this and that and the other. But here is Jesus speaking about what will actually accomplish the end. It's not learning all the details of the enemy's plans. It's actually the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom in such a way that it will accomplish the end. There is a battle. There is a contest. And I fear that so many of us are looking in the wrong direction. We're so preoccupied with Satan's plans and agenda to such a level of detail that I find really alarming. You know, somebody might think, you know, we shared some details today, and someone might think, well, brother, you just did that. Yes, I did that a little bit to show you where prophecy is fulfilling. I could spend hours going into detail of every single point <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of every single point that I mention, and we could be here for hours, and let's go through the list of names, let's go all these, and it will not help us any more than just seeing what prophecy says and going back to what really matters. This is really my burden. Have we lost focus of our mission? This is the mission that Jesus talked about here. This gospel of the kingdom, I want you to think about that, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, because I want to link this with another verse. Another verse where Jesus says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is this what you are seeking first? Today, now, currently, in the current happenings? Are you seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness? Or are you seeking to find out the latest detail, conspiracy, video, now, I'm asking, what are you seeking first? What is your priority? What occupies your greatest focus and attention? What occupies the most time? I put it to you that most of us are not really seeking the kingdom first. And I'm getting that sense based on all the conversations and interactions that I have with people. As a matter of fact, I find myself tending in that direction sometimes, and I have to actually stop. I have to stop watching the news. No more videos on these topics. I've had enough for a while. I have to take a break. I'm not presenting myself here as the standard. We are all brothers and sisters in this dilemma. There is a spiritual battle coming. Are we ready? Here is our mission. In light of this, I want you to think about that, <clears throat> that point. In light of the verse of where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This gospel of the kingdom is actually only going to be preached successfully by those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You realize that? Not anybody can preach the gospel of the kingdom. 
Now, many people are attempting, many people are professing, many people seem like they are, but we're still here, aren't we? The gospel of the kingdom to be preached in the way that Jesus intends is only possible by those who seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. I want you to consider the ramifications of that. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom is not sharing the latest conspiracy video. Again, I'm not knocking that, but, but that's, that's what we tend to look, look at the amount of stuff that you share. Just look at your experience. Look at where you spend your time. Look at where your focus is. Look at what you most readily want to share with people. Usually it's the latest, greatest scandal or some exposure of something that happened. The gospel of the kingdom many times is not our focus and our priority. It's like we already know that. Everybody knows that. But this video over here, this thing that happened over here, nobody knows that. Let's share that. If you're feeling a little bit uh, like this message applies to you, then that's good. <laughs> that's the idea. Beware of getting so distracted by the enemy and his plans that we lose focus of the real mission. When Jesus says here, the gospel will be, will be preached for a witness, he's, he's talking about more than just preaching. And, and speaking, because there are so many people who feel that they're preaching the gospel, and they're not preaching the gospel. It says here it will be preached in all the world for a witness. You know what that means? That's a demonstration. That demonstration is only possible by people who are in the kingdom, because they seek first that kingdom. If you're not in the kingdom, you can't preach the gospel of the kingdom, no matter how many words you use, because it's a demonstration. It's a witness. It's a display. How is your life today? Is your life a display and a demonstration of the gospel of the kingdom? Hard questions I'm asking tonight, I know. Because we focus on all these uh, interesting juicy details of what the enemy is up to. Let's focus on what really matters, brothers and sisters. That is really the proper way to prepare for the last days. It's good to know about some of the things that's happening, but it's better to know what really matters. How is your faith today? There are many people, believers, like I said, who are fearful because they are looking at what is coming and they feel unprepared because they have been led to believe that preparation involves all these physical things how is your faith? Look, we know how the story ends, right? The Bible prophecy tells us we know how the story ends. And I find it interesting that in prophecy, God has not given us every single detail of the enemy's plans. He has given us overview. Here is what's going to happen. Here is how it ends. So that we cannot fail in our faith. But we know how the story ends. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Us knowing so much details will not change the outcome. Feeding our faith is based on the Word of God. I want to leave you with three points based on what we covered. Don't be distracted by the enemy's plans. Point number two, how are you preparing spiritually for what is coming? You know, many people have a plan of they want to go to the country, do this, stock up there, and, and some kind of a plan. It's good to have a plan. What is your spiritual plan to prepare for the last days? That's a good question to ask. Maybe sit down and, and think about it practically and write something of where spiritually you need to plan for your faith, for your experience, and work towards it with God's help. Thinking you will just sail through, hoping for the best, might not quite work. We need to exercise firm, intelligent faith. Are you spiritually planning for what is coming? That's important to do. And finally, based on this verse, are you a witness? In other words, does this verse apply to you or not? Are you part of the solution of preaching the gospel? Or are you part of the problem? Because if you're not the one, you are the other. These are the questions I want to challenge you and leave, challenge you with and leave with you, brothers and sisters. We see what's happening. Let's focus 
on what really matters. Where are you looking and what are you doing? Let it be spiritual first and foremost. We'll leave it there. Let's close with a word of prayer. I'll ask you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have revealed to us what will happen in the end, the outcome. And we thank you that we are so close to the end. I pray that you will inspire our hearts with faith, confidence, and deeper trust in you. That we might not be alarmed by what is going on, that we might not be distracted, and that we might not lose focus on what really matters. Please enable us to be able to fulfill what you desire and plan for us, as Jesus said, to preach the gospel and that our lives may be a witness of the gospel of the kingdom. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this high calling. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.